thank you, and thank you, everyone. Um, let's start. I can probably skip the introduction slide here. And if you are too shy to ask questions in person, here's my Twitter account, Folletto double L double T. So, Calypso. Um, already had really great presentations so far, so I don't really need to get too much into detail. I usually start with this very simple explanation, really high level, to show what Calypso means for us. Um, and of course, WordPress.com is a lot more than this, but in this general abstraction, I think it's a, it's a fair uh, simplification. So Calypso was actually, as you can imagine, a pretty huge undertaking. Um, this is a high-level view again, and it's probably way more than this, um, but still, when we look into uh, what it took to get us there, um, one thing that was mentioned, for example, in announce post was the development time and what led us there. But what I find interesting is that uh, there is a lot more that happened even before we started writing code. Uh, in the sense that the platform started really as a sort of JavaScript prototype uh, to try out a uh, user experience, a new kind, a new approach we were actually working uh, up until that moment. And I've, I've done some uh, design archaeology, and I found uh, that, yes, there were, there were a lot of discussion, and there was a really nice, beautiful moment um, of work around uh, wireframes that lasted roughly a month. Uh, that was done by a designer that collected uh, pretty much all the work done until that moment, and started with Balsamic, a very simple wireframe that tried to collate everything. So Melchoice did uh, this great work. Uh, that, in a sense, brought us uh, together to then forge also the technology side. And on the other hand, this is probably a graphic that if you saw the announcement and already seen, uh, it was a huge amount of work. Um, tens of thousands of commits, um, 7,000 reviews just in these 20 months, and of course even more right now. And so the question we get, I got, uh, when I present this to people that are not comfortable, not from our in industry, is we are, we are a fully distributed company. We are having trouble to talk to the other office. Um, how do you make it work? How do you make something that is probably one of the biggest uh, React code bases in the world and one of the big, uh, biggest user experiences existing uh, on the web, how do you make it um, in, in a fully distributed company? So I'm trying to touch this a little bit today. Um, this is one of the elements of our creed, uh, communication oxygen. Um, because we, what we look for, even when we hire people, we try to look for people that are able not just to do their own job, like what they formally are hired for, but they're also great communicators. They are people that are able to talk with others, they are people that are able to interact, give proper feedback, and so a lot of soft skills are spent and used here. And I just checked uh, a couple of weeks ago our numbers, and we have 160,000 messages per week across Slack, um, across P2s, and across all our communication channels. Uh, 470 people, probably now even more, and 1,000 deployments per week, which is, doesn't just mean deployments. It also means that each one of these deployments was actually someone that wrote it and discussed it with at least another person uh, to make it into production. The other aspect that make us work so well um, is that we are all, and again, this happens since hiring, highly independent individuals in the sense that um, the people that try to, we try to get to our company are the people that are very motivated. They are, for example, they are often, this kind of people are freelancers because there are people that have experienced it firsthand that there is a goal to reach and they have to reach it no matter what. And they don't need any guidance that if they don't know something, they will look for it. If they need to know how to build something, again, they will look for it or ask for help. And so the combination of the first the soft skills and these uh, highly independence are a really good combination to make it work in a distributed environment such as ours. So here's my team. Um, this was the team Hyperion, roughly uh, when we were working around this. And at the time, we were probably one of the most European ones, um, distributed about two time zones across Europe, uh, none of us living in the, in the same city. 
And Hyperion, over time, worked on a few elements of Calypso itself, a bit of navigation themes, which is our core. Uh, and we help it with menus, and we do also a fair amount of work in the framework itself. And today, just to try to get a little bit into more the details of, in a sense, the day-to-day -day work, I'm going to talk to you about the theme showcase, which is, again, the main focus of uh, Hyperion. And so how we made uh, possible to create this, um, this piece of the feature of Calypso inside Calypso. So where we start? Well, themes are probably one of the most uh, relevant and visible things of WordPress. Uh, we have hundreds of them uh, on WordPress.com. And of course, what we want to make possible is for everyone that joins uh, the, our software to be able to find exactly the kind of design they need, exactly the kind of thing uh, that fits their own business, their own blog, their own whatever experience they're trying to build. And so we have, for example, over the years, built what we call the Showcase 2.0, uh, which allows you to do that, you filter. And then we also have THX, uh, which was then, of course, a collaboration with .org. Again, uh, Matthias, we talked today. And this brings us to two, but we have even more because we tried to rewrite it again. And we, so we have another Showcase, which dubbed 4.0. As you can imagine, this is not exactly a good situation. It's bad for users, because depending where you come in, you get a fairly different experience with a different set of features. And of course, it's difficult to maintain, because pretty much every single bug is likely to be happening, or all the three of them, or you need to identify on which one of them is actually happening and why it is happening. So of course, when Calypso happened, we set our goal. We need to make possible, retire all the three showcases, and set up four to have one single theme showcase for everyone. So let's start building this. One key aspect of distributed companies that sometimes is underestimated is FaceTime. So some in the collective imagination, when we talk about uh, distributed companies, people think, oh, you never meet, you never show up face to face, how can you do that? Actually, every single fully distributed company that I'm aware of does at least once a year a full company meetup. In Automatic specifically, we do that once a year, and every team is able to meet up to three, four times a year, depending on what they need to do. So FaceTime is important because it builds socialization, it allows the whole team to know each other better, and of course, there are certain things that, yes, can happen in distributed, but are way more efficient when done in person. And so, kind of surprisingly, this actually happened for us in Vienna. So we came here, here um, last year, and we met together, the whole team appeared. And in the mornings, we went around the city, uh, we ate really good food, and, and if we had a good time knowing each other. And in the afternoon, we actually conducted workshop activities. So we met together in one room, we discussed it. Uh, if you've never done this kind of workshop, I highly suggest to see and buy uh, Game Storming. It's an amazing book about the subject. So we did, among the various activities, what I kind of call epic planning. And the approach of epic planning is that everyone for 10 minutes writes down on a single post-it one single milestone for each post-it. And that milestone needs to be, in a sense, a minimal viable feature, user-facing. And so doing this, again, after that, you put it everyone together. And the only rule is that if there are two different milestones, they need to be strictly stuck one after the other. So after this, the team is then highly coordinated. We were pretty much aware of what we wanted to build in the long term. Um, and some people that never experienced this kind of workshop were really, really highly energized. So, then we focus. So, the, the good thing about this kind of approach, it means that each milestone is highly focused. So, this brings us to building the, the actual first milestones. So we back our, to our home and offices. Well, it's not always this, it's more like this. Um, and this doesn't exist until we communicate. But we don't have an office space. 
So on digital, you need to pay more attention to the fact that there is not an implicit space where things are shared. And for us, there are many different tools, um, but the three main tools that we use on a model called the three speeds is that the real-time speed is Slack for us, so it's where we discuss synchronously. Then we have P2s, which is for asynchronous communications, and we have a special wiki theme that is for things that are meant to last longer, like setting up a VPN or things like that. So you get, I get back, I open my environment, a few of the P2s, uh, the desktop application, and the first thing we do is actually writing what we call text stand-ups. Test standouts are very useful because make each one of us aware when we come online. So we know that from that moment on, the other person is online. And at the same time, it allows each other to know roughly what they're doing and, of course, to ask questions. Pretty much with, um, like a normal stand-up you can do in person. This is, is a very, very simple and very, very effective way to synchronize across teams and across time zones. And, of course, the other thing is we post the roadmap so until it's posted, nobody automatically knows what we are building. So the roadmap is as simple as a post, is as simple as a bullet list. You don't need any spe special tool. And with this, everyone in the company now is able to see it. And the next step is that we, we take the first milestone and we write another post, which is the master thread, that contains the whole history about that specific milestone contains where I find the design, where we are meant to release it, where all the code is uh, hold, where all the tickets are, and when the text testing happens, when we start doing testing. So we start designing. Um, I'm a designer in the team, so I start in this case, among the many different tools, I could have used uh, Marvel, Envision. In this case, I wanted to experiment, so I used OmniGraffle, and I published the, uh, interactive PDFs which may seem odd, but they're very easy to share, and they're interactive, so once you downloaded it, you can actually click around exactly as in a browser. So the first iteration was just the main activation flow, then we start adding feedback, and we get more, the whole mapping of all the flows for our first milestone. And at this point, we knew we got enough feedback, we knew that the flows were good enough, and so we proceeded to the actual visual design. Um, another interesting byproduct of approaching these things in clear milestones and very, very highly scoped milestones is that pretty much everything we need to build can stay in roughly a single image like this. So a blueprint like this one is able both to show the screens, pixel perfect, but also the flows that happens between the screens. And again, we trade more. Uh, this time, I wanted to clarify a few things with a few of the other designers. But even more, I wanted to make sure that the design was ready to be ported to both iOS and Android. Uh, it wasn't part of the work here to do that, but I wanted to make sure that every single piece I designed for web didn't go against, explicitly, the platform standards of the, the Apple uh, HIG and the um, Google Material design. So I made sure of that just chatting with the experts that are developing in these fields. And this leads us to, again, iteration five, uh, which again got some feedback. And you can see already a glimpse of what is going to be next um, of iOS and Android. So we did five iterations. What's interesting here is that all of this, as you can probably imagine, happens only on P2 posts and, as I mentioned, on Slack. So each one of these is basically a discussion that happened. And what's beautiful is that each one of the P2s of our teams is visible to everyone else. So pretty much everyone in the company, if they're interested in it, of, or if you want to get feedback, we are then able to suddenly gather all these uh, insights. And in me the meantime, of course, development was going on. Uh, we use GitHub. Now, of course, it's open source, so, so you can pretty much see in the open how we work. Uh, but internally, my team uh, chose to use also Trello as a Kanban board to just set a rhythm week by week of how we work. And one interesting tweak we did is that we have the last column done, and we create a new column every time uh, we do uh, a new week. So it's very easy to see the past history. So um, on GitHub, Again, what's interesting here is that we use um, 
Yes, it's a very simple process. When we create a PR, a pull request, to do changes in the code, uh, it's marked in progress until the development is done. So the developer thinks it's OK. Uh, I think I did everything I needed. I tested it. And then it's marked in need review. So everyone else, every other developer in the company could now chime in, check the code, and make sure that actually follows our standards, is good enough, and um, all everything we wanted to, to be aligned is aligned as we wanted. And then when it's, when it's done, the review is done, the small changes maybe are, have been completed, then we're ready to merge it. So again, we just change the tag and we merge it back. And then it gets deployed automatically. Now, the interesting thing about this process is that we also do design in the same way. So similarly, if code gets pushed in, we are also able to add a design review tag. So every designer in the company can chime in into development and check um, if the implementation of design is correct, which is very useful both for designs that maybe were uh, big designs that were pre uh, prepared before, but also for very small tweaks that maybe a developer found a bug and wanted to fix it, and the easiest way is just adding then a tag and making sure that the design aligns with our standards again. So very simple, really, but it's pretty much effective and ensure that everything is reviewed properly, at least as long as we remember to tag it. Um, the, the thing that all these tools enable is transparency, which is an incredible powerful thing because enables that things that are said once don't need to be um, replicated in multiple silos and multiple channels just because someone does, doesn't have access. But at the same time, it means that everyone in the company, again, can see everything. So for example, just picking up one thing, the code reviews, it doesn't mean that the same team that uh, is working on the feature does the code review as well. It can be anyone else in the company. So this allows our knowledge to be shared across teams as much as possible. And of course, while we were building now, uh, we have a phase of testing. So we decided that our milestone at some point was feature complete. So we started first an internal testing. So we opened up to automatic and we said across all our um, P2s that uh, we're done, we think we're done at least. Uh, so please come and if you have some time, test it out. We want to test thoroughly and check that everything works. And the interesting thing we activated uh, is called the Horizon, which is pretty much the same thing. But if you go to horizonfeedback.wordpress.com, you can actually access um, the work we are actually doing. Uh, so we post there when we're developing a new milestone like this one, or sometimes we post for features that we think were useful, uh, but maybe we want to check with others. So this is really open to everyone to join and give us feedback. And so across these two items, we gather even more feedback, and a few weeks later, we're able to launch um, what's um, our first version of the theme showcase. And yes, my team uses uh, Neon Cats to mark the milestones. Um, now, I mean numbers, what does it mean? Um, one interesting thing about these numbers is that if you think about this kind of sized feature, um, and I knew before checking the numbers that I got good feedback. But I was still surprised to see uh, how good these numbers were. Because um, in, the, in my past experience, especially with the agency work, it's very uncommon to get this kind of thorough feedback across so many people, uh, both internally and externally. Um, and just to give you a sizing, um, this is pretty much how long it lasted. So four days of meetup and about 3.5 months of work. 3.5 months is a really good length because um, in my experience and talk with others, I found out that in three months you're able to build pretty much good-sized features, but at the same time, um, you're not frustrated for something that is taking too long to be released. So in, I found out that three months is roughly an ideal measure for, for a good milestone in this sense. And of course, everything needs to be measured. Um, our task here is replacing uh, a core piece of the WordPress.com experience. So our goal here wasn't growth or wasn't sales or wasn't anything, but was just to keep everything stable. So we want to make sure that everything we are changing doesn't impact negatively uh, everything else in WordPress.com. So 
We just made sure, and uh, as you can see, just after there is a, a small dip, that's pretty much common after a release, because maybe people are disoriented, they're still figuring their way out, but then it goes back to uh, stable numbers. So just to, to go back to the principles, one interesting aspect about distributed companies is that they exist on a continuum. Now, local companies and distributed companies are actually the simplest scenarios because they are both homogeneous. They have the same kind of people working in the same kind of environment. The real trouble um, are the companies that are instead remote. So they have one office somewhere, and some people are actually distributed uh, somewhere else because this creates a two-tire environment. So this is a big challenge. And it's not surprising in a sense because when you actually think of it, a lot of the companies that think they're local or a company that grows is actually a company that is becoming remote because the moment that the company grows beyond a single floor, a single office, a single city or a single country, that company already is a remote company. And the problem often is that managers and HR tend to think about the company as it, it is still a local company. And that creates a lot of tension and a lot of difficulty and challenges in growing. So if you think about this continuum, then you can start approaching it in a different way. And what's, inter what's interesting, these are the six principles we, I mentioned today during the talk, is that none of this is really um, groundbreaking. None of this is actually unique of distributed companies. However, some of these, like communication is oxygen, uh, clear communication spaces, are way more relevant uh, for the way distributed companies are set up. And in general, if you think really about this, it just means that these are principles for doing good business, having a good company that works properly. And I usually like to close with a quote for a great uh, Italian designer to invite every one of you to simplify uh, as much as possible. And here we are. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much.